that's a show off. Unless what they're showing off is dope as These videos are not for children. If you're a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. Talking about your least favorite superhero, Peacemaker. If you would have told me a few years back that the first DC character to go from the movies to getting their own TV show would be Peacemaker, I would have asked, who the fuck is Peacemaker? I think it's safe to say that the only reason this show actually exists is because John Cena is the one playing Peacemaker. That's not an insult by any means. Just the opposite. John Cena was one of the most charismatic men to enter a wrestling ring. And he's now one of the most charismatic men in Hollywood. The guy has a personality the size of his muscles. That is to say that there's way too much of it, and it absolutely can't be natural. I'm kidding, of course. You know, I can specifically remember a time back in 2008. I was hanging out in my basement with Joe Dice of GTS, before he was Joe Dice of GTS, and we were watching a bunch of shorts Cena created for WWE.com. He did this weekly segment called Five Questions with the Champ. And he was just so relentlessly funny and fun to watch. So much so that I turned to Dice, who has always loved John Cena, and said, you know, I just really wish John Cena would stop wrestling and start acting. Because even during the times that I didn't necessarily like him as a wrestler, I still really liked him as a performer. John Cena is a constant entertainer, which is a big part of the reason that he got as far as he did in sports entertainment. Very few people could take a character as ridiculously flawed and unknowingly awful as Peacemaker and make you kind of want to root for them. The reason he's so likable is because he's obnoxiously oblivious to the terrible things that he's doing. He lacks all kinds of self-awareness. And yet, no matter how accidentally awful he acts, he still thinks that he's a man of moral. He's like Michael Scott with muscles. This show really manages to endear audiences to the character. Much, much more than the Suicide Squad did. I like that they show that he does in fact have remorse for his terrible actions, and that he's only done what he's done because he falsely believed he was doing the right thing. Which I think is something a lot of people can relate to. You know, how many times have you thought you were doing something good, and then months to years later you look back on it and you're like, Oh, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the dick there. He was acting out in the name of righteousness, never realizing that he was being the very thing that he sought to stop. I love it. Even if it's played for laughs, this is still a really good development. It's not necessarily an evolution of the character per se, it's more of a revelation for the audience learning more about the duality of this person and just exactly how his imperfect mind works. His strange existence only makes that much more sense when we see where he was raised and who he was raised by. This poor little nutcase never had a chance. His upcoming was always going to breed, at the very least, social confusion and a skewed sense of morality. The occasional good that shines through with this character is a testament to how good he is at his core. Despite himself, he is the star of the show. Not just in the fact that he's the titular character, but in terms of being the best character. Which, by the way, is not always the case. Just look at How I Met Your Mother. You think people were watching that for Ted? No. Absolutely not. He is the best performance in the show. Which is saying quite a bit, considering how many great performances there are in the series. In the show, we find out that Peacemaker actually has an animal sidekick in an eagle very creatively named Eagly. I kinda gotta give the show credit here, because this is some really good animation. HBO Max does not skimp on the budget. This is an all CGI character, which makes sense as James Gunn just can't fucking help himself. You know, you gotta include one in every movie, and now TV show too, apparently. But this bird has spunk, and it's adorable, and seriously, this is frighteningly good CGI. It's Always Sunny recently had an episode that included a CGI monkey, and the CGI looked really good until it started moving around, and it came off as very stiff and unnatural. But Eagly's movements are completely realistic. There's some scenes where it seems like it's just a really, really well-trained eagle. You can't house-train an eagle, dude. Not without stealing its soul. Peacemaker also has a person sidekick, and he's an equally, if not more oblivious wannabe superhero named Vigilante. I think this character exists not only for the laughs to be had at their expense, but also to create a visual compare and contrast between him and Peacemaker. 
He represents the person Peacemaker used to be, while Peacemaker today has changed significantly since the events of the Suicide Squad, and he's questioning a lot of his past ways. Vigilante is a physical conflict to that, as he idolizes the person Peacemaker used to be, and his involvement in his life today seems to pull him back into making impulsive, immature decisions that usually glorify violence. But in a much less analytical take, he's funny and he has good chemistry with John Cena. Peacemaker's father is just about every terrible thing you could think a person could be. He's old school and ignorant, uh, by which I mean he's racist and homophobic. And not even in the whole, I don't get this lifestyle type of way, in the very blatant, hateful type of way. He's a I despise and loathe them because they're not the same as me type of guy. You know, th this isn't the look both ways before he says the n-word type of racist. This is the I'm gonna walk up straight to your face and get in your face when I say it type. Guy's one scary mother And it doesn't help matters that he's being played by the T-1000. Robert Patrick could grow to be 112 years old and he would still be a nightmare walking amongst men. Guy is 63 now, and if he looked in my direction, I think instinctively I would have to look away. And I'm not a passive man, but I ain't taking chances I don't need to be taken. Leota is so perfectly awkward, and she acts less like a fish out of water, and more like a fish out of water sent onto a frying pan. The character is about as out of her element at her job as the actress is completely in her element on the show. She's the new girl on the team. And what makes matters even worse for her is that she's the weird new girl. No, not that one. Come, come on, editing V. You know that's not what I meant. You may wonder what she's doing being attached to this team, as it doesn't seem like she carries the same set of skills as everyone else on it. And that's because nepotism. As she's Amanda Waller's daughter. A plot twist I didn't see coming. And neither will the rest of the cast of characters because she doesn't tell anybody. So it looks like Peacemaker isn't the only one with some parental issues. Something I imagine that will be touched on relatively soon. Then you have Harcourt, who's pretty much the straight man in all of this madness. She's very clearly the Alice in Alice in Wonderland here. In the sense that everyone else is batshit crazy, but she herself seems to be the most reasonable one. She's almost always the smartest person in the room. And you can't tell if that's because she's genuinely incredibly intelligent, or it's just the fact that she's surrounded by idiots. Oh, come on, man, don't use the I word, it's not cool. We don't get to learn a whole lot about her character, but what we do get to know is enough to make us want to know more. Similarly, we get Clemson Mum, who honestly kind of serves the same purpose, although we do get a little bit more of his backstory, and he is also a frightening dude. The way he conducts himself and the way that his past is talked up, and also considering where he's stationed in this task force, kind of seems like it makes him the male equivalent of Viola Davis's character. It's like you got a man Waller over here. But again, this is only three episodes in, and we don't get a whole lot of time with the character or information on him. So that could change relatively soon. And then you have Beard Dye, whose plight I definitely sympathize with. Cause that's right guys, I too dye my beard. This big burly black beard ain't natural. I'm actually a beard brunette, maybe even a little bit ginger which I know is definitely going to upset some of you as it's yet another case of a ginger being scrubbed from existence. Oh, these fucking woke agendas, man. There's also a whole slew of other characters, including the janitor, the neighbor, the chick peacemaker and vigilante, the husband of the chick peacemaker and vigilante, judo master. But as of right now, we haven't been given a whole lot of time with them. So making a comment past saying that they exist would be a little bit hard for me to do. Although the janitor, his first back and forth with Peacemaker was fucking hilarious. And I'd really like it if we get to see him used more. Just give me like a buddy cop episode with these two and I'm, I'm set. I'm there. I like that the show is taking its time setting up and developing the dynamics between these characters. We're now three episodes in and we still haven't seen all the characters in the show's intro interact with one another. Some we've only seen show up for one scene. This is a show that exists in its continuity, but isn't shackled down by that continuity. There are plenty of references to other characters in the DCEU, and references made to past events in the DCEU. But Peacemaker is so far removed from everything else going on in this giant universe, that it doesn't have to tack on whatever the latest events of this world are. And if it does, it's doing it somewhere in the background, where it makes sense. 
You know, we'll, we'll talk about Aquaman, but we don't need to cut in with a Jason Momoa cameo that adds nothing to the overall plot. It never feels like the show goes out of its way to reference things. The Easter eggs are brought up naturally, li like in passing, and I very much appreciate that. It makes this feel tied into everything else, but it doesn't go out of its way to explain exactly where it's tied into everything else, nor should it. This show has one of the most hilariously bizarre intros I've ever seen in a show. Just a bunch of all different types of people doing a TikTok dance, stone-faced. James Gunn, you... you did it again, you... fuck you. What I find really weird about this is that there's people out there who have written this off entirely. The common complaint seems to be, Oh, this is basically just another Marvel show. And that statement just proves to me that there are people out there who have no actual earthly idea what the fuck it is they're talking about. John Cena f***s a scene queen hair metal looking metahuman in the first episode. The T-1000 is out here spurting out racial slurs in that same episode. This is literally nothing like a Marvel show. Yeah, you remember that one time that Tony Stark banged a mutant while Captain America went off about the good old days? No, you don't because it never fucking happened. The comparison that's being made is being made because, like some MCU films, this show is fun. And I'm sorry. Like, truly, I I'm sorry that this show isn't as bleak and miserable as your parents have made you. This is coming from someone who prefers DC to Marvel, and someone who likes darker toned stories. There is nothing wrong with having darkness coexist with Goofy. Dark comedies are a thing. This show is just that. They're facing serious threats. They touch on real-world issues. This whole show and the events of the show are very dark in nature, but the people involved in these tragic, traumatic stories are absolute goofs. Once again, that's why I love this. All of these people, despite being mostly well-qualified for their jobs, are shown to be very inept in some form or fashion, which is also a point of contention with detractors from the show. But real talk here, I think it's a really good display of real life. Be honest here. Over the years, whether it be someone in your own personal life or a celebrity that you've seen on TV, wasn't there someone you thought had their shit together, and then you found out down the line you were not only mistaken, but you were gravely mistaken in thinking that? I know I have. When I was a kid, almost every adult seemed like they knew what they were doing. But then as I got older, I realized, holy shit, these people don't know what the fuck is going on. Absolutely nobody knows what it is they're doing, from one minute to the next. We're all just a bunch of chickens running around with their heads cut off. This show is incredibly stupid, in the best ways. It is one of my favorite things I've seen done in the DCEU. And I like that it finds a way to coexist with the dark broodiness of this universe. Like, it stands out because of how different it is, but it doesn't feel so different that it's entirely out of place. It, it's like the perfect middle ground. I don't know how this man does it, but I have never seen anything bad that had James Gunn's name attached to it. Now granted, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm saying I haven't seen it. I've always been a fan of the DC shows. I actually kinda like the CW-verse. But that's not to say that those shows are perfect by any means. Far from it. These shows are incredibly goofy, but we're supposed to take them seriously. This is what we're supposed to take seriously. Look at that animation. Amazing bulk, eat your heart out. Now, Peacemaker, on the other hand, is a show where the threats are serious, but they're played for laughs. Peacemaker is a show that is very aware of just how ridiculous it is. And not only does it never try to hide that, it's constantly calling attention to it. The fact that this show is so unapologetically strange, so ridiculously bizarre, gives me high hope for the future of it. And I maybe jump in the gun here. You see what I, you see what I did there? Because... Because James Gunn... Anyway, I may be jumping the gun here, as we're only three episodes into the season, but it's because of these reasons that I would say that Peacemaker is currently the best DC show. Right on up there with Superman and Lois. I would tie them for the number one spot. Two very different shows, but two very great shows in their own unique ways. But maybe Superman and Lois is discussion for another day. Being as this is a review following the first three episodes of the first season, I'm gonna need y'all to let me know in the comment section below if you'd like to see me follow this up when the show follows this up. So if you liked what you heard and you want to hear more, type in the comment section... Peacemaker. 
What a joke. Anyway, with all that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. What superhero are you? Peacemaker. <laughs> Get out of here! You a fan? There's no superhero called Peacemaker! Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. Back at it again, talking about everyone's least favorite superhero, Peacemaker. I previously covered the first three episodes of the series on the channel, so if you haven't watched that yet, feel free to check it out. Of course, following that up, I will now be covering the next three episodes in the canon, and boy oh boy do these three episodes do a whole lot. What I really love about this show is that all of these characters feel like real people, and I get how that might sound odd or ironic, considering that we're talking about a show where a lot of the people on the show may not actually be real people. But it's true. Each and every one of these characters put to screen is uniquely flawed in their own way. They're all fucked up in their own specific ways. And yet, they never come across as a trope or stereotypical. Well, except for Peacemaker's father. Not a whole lot of nuance in that performance. But to be fair, there's not usually a whole lot of subtlety to outright racism. Usually. Peacemaker was depicted as being an oblivious asshole. But an asshole, nonetheless, in the Suicide Squad. But this show gives a more in-depth look at how he got to be this way. Despite taking place four years into the future, the show tells a whole lot about Peacemaker's past, and the events that took place prior to the Suicide Squad. He's a lovable, but also hateable moron who's just trying to do what he thinks is right. The issue is, is that he's gullible and exhibits piss-poor judgment in the moral department. Which is to be expected when someone was raised by the Grand Wizard and was taught hatred. But to his credit, he's desperately trying to find his own way. To find his own feeling of what is right and what is wrong. His judgment is of course clouded by his past upbringing and his just overall stupidity. But the guy does go out there and give it the old college try. And truthfully speaking, when someone has been raised by the type of person that he's been raised by, that mental transition just doesn't happen overnight. Nor does it come with picture-perfect clarity on all things right and wrong. Because of this, the guy's prone to making mistakes. He's constantly confused as to what he should and shouldn't do. And regardless of these facts, he feels strongly about going out there and doing something. He needs to. Sitting idly by is not in his nature. He wants to be a symbol of justice. Hell, a whole lot of the time, he believes that he is a symbol of justice. But at the end of the day, all that really is is a front. Deep down, Peacemaker knows that he's clueless. That's why he constantly questions his own actions. That's why he feels so much remorse and an overwhelming amount of guilt for the things that he's done. Things that he once felt so strongly about. What he was positive was a positive thing. He now reflects back on and sees it as a negative. And because of this, he questions his own character. The guy may not have a whole lot of brains, but he does have a whole lot of heart. This show makes sure that you know that. And I think that's the real tragedy of the character. He's dumb, but he's just smart enough to know that he's dumb. He's just smart enough to realize each and every flaw and problem in his life. But he isn't smart enough to make better choices, or to find solutions. He's smart enough to know that his father is a bad person. He's smart enough to know how little he means to his father. But he's not smart enough to not love him unconditionally. Despite the fact that his father very clearly despises him. He can't help but love him because that's his dad. That's the only family he's ever known. Well, him and his brother who is no longer with us. Peacemaker is attached to someone who is completely disconnected from him. Attached to someone who is completely disgusted by him. And yet the guy still wears his heart on his sleeve. Acting like the proverbial child in their parents' clothing. Desperately trying to play the part and make them proud. Shit like this is where the show excels. It walks the line of being both a comedy and a tragedy. Peacemaker's goofy. There's a reason why I called him Michael Scott with muscles. Which, by the way, from this point on, he shall be known as Muscle Scott. The character's obviously played for laughs. But despite this, his life is overwhelmingly sad. He is sad. When John Cena isn't on screen cutting jokes, he's desperately trying to avoid having a mental breakdown. To no avail, usually. The scenes where we see Peacemaker interact with others, he's kind of a bit of a dick. But in the moments when he's just alone with himself and his own thoughts, we see him really start to unravel. Truth of the matter is, is that Peacemaker needs these people in his life more than he needs anything else. 
Because around them, he's able to put on a strong face. But alone, he's reduced to a puddle of a man. Once again, that's why I say this show toes the line perfectly between comedy and tragedy. This is not an easy atmosphere to cultivate. Both John Cena and James Gunn deserve all the credit in the world for being able to make this work. And making it work as well as they do. Believe it or not, I was actually able to get in touch with John Cena himself and get him to spare a few comments for this video. When I asked him about his acting approach and the psychological backing of the Peacemaker character, he said the following. Well, that guy, uh, that guy is a talker, let me tell you. I'll be releasing the full shoot interview with him in the near future, so look forward to that. We learn a lot about Peacemaker and his awful upbringing in these episodes. We also learn a lot about his family life as well. We haven't gotten the full story just yet, because the show does a pretty good job of telling its audience just enough to get them invested, but it also keeps enough of its backstory hidden, leaving each and every arc it sets up, past, present, and future, branded with a to-be-continued logo, which is the sign of a good storyteller. I can't speak for anybody else, but I personally will be tuning in on a weekly basis because I haven't seen the full story yet. You know, this isn't like Smallville. I can't go missing a couple episodes and still be aware of everything going on. Each episode is integral to the overall plot of The Peacemaker Show. Each and every episode seamlessly sticks together, and it feels less like I'm watching a show, and more like I'm watching a movie that's broken down into parts. If you're missing so much as one episode of the franchise, you're missing a whole chunk of the overall story. We learn that Peacemaker's father isn't just the uncle no one likes to talk to or invite to family dinners, due to his extreme beliefs and his constant need to express them. I have one of those myself. We learn that Peacemaker's father was genuinely a white supremacist. Look, you guys know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not trying to get demonetized here. This guy was a founding father of hatred. Not only being a bad guy, but being a bad guy. He was the supervillain known as the White Dragon. Because, of course, it had to be the White something. He also trained both of his sons to kill from an early age. Peacemaker's childhood was less about ice cream and more about making others scream. What I'm trying to say is that there was really no gray areas with this character. Everything about him is black and white. Mostly white. M mostly white. And to make matters even worse, in present day, him and his cult-like followers are now making a return to action. Oh, great. Vigilante is hilarious. And in a show of complete comic relief characters, he stands out as the comic reliefiest. I heard a lot of people comparing him to Deadpool, and I really, really, really wanted to fight that comparison. But if I'm being honest, there is one to be made. Although I will say that Vigilante is a much more grounded Deadpool. He's not overpowered. I mean, if anything, he's underpowered. And also undereducated, but that's a completely different subject. But his lack of superpowers don't stop him from approaching each scenario like he has the world by the vigilantes. He is a hazard to everyone around him, including himself, maybe especially himself. Unlike Peacemaker, he does have a defined moral code, and it's actually quite strict, which is both a good and a bad thing. The guy is highly offended by racism, but was also ready to assassinate your local pothead. So it's hard to tell where the line is with this one. Also, it's more than likely that he's a bit of a sociopath. He also openly admits to allegedly not having feelings, and has a fondness for killing, as if it's his favorite activity. Like, the dude has no other hobby. Not to mention that he doesn't stand by his code. It's not really solidified. It kind of changes up over time. This character is also prone to manipulation and is self-obsessed enough to make stupid mistakes in an effort to raise his value in the eyes of others. But to his credit, what he lacks in brains he makes up for and brave. Leota proves to be the most normal of the team. While she's trained in her field, educated in what it is she's doing, and exhibits high intelligence, she's a complete fish out of water. She has the right qualifications, but she's still very out of place. She doesn't like doing the dirty work. She absolutely detests the idea of taking a life, and she struggles with the tasks that are assigned to her time and time again. Leota is the socially awkward heart of the team seeing the best in others even when maybe she probably shouldn't. Not to mention that she's quick to get attached to those she's been assigned to keep an eye on. 
We learn later on that Amanda Waller essentially had her set up Peacemaker, but we see her struggle with making that decision, as she stated from her very first interaction with Peacemaker that more than thinking that he's a good guy, she thinks that he's a good guy. Clemson Mern was a man of mystery, until it was eventually revealed that he's no man at all. He's a butterfly. I'm just laughing about that because I'm imagining that if you haven't watched the series, but for some reason you're watching my video, my words must make zero sense to you. There's a really interesting development with his character. This whole time the character's past has been brought up in passing, stating how truly relentless he was in taking lives, how notorious and infamous the guy is for how truly awful he was. But then we find out that ultimately this character isn't the one the series has been building up. It's the butterfly that took that character over. But of course, this butterfly is different. He's not like other butterflies. While his species wants world domination, he just wants to live. And he aids in the fight against his own kind. He thinks what they're doing is completely immoral. And the only reason that he took over Clemson specifically was because this butterfly intentionally went out of its way to find the worst person possible to invade. And yet still, despite this, this creature is sorry for its actions, feeling that it robbed this man of the opportunity of seeking redemption for his ways. Beard Dye is intelligent from a technological standpoint, but clearly inept socially and also in decision making. Although to be fair, he surprisingly rises to the occasion, saving the team not once, but twice so far in this series, and doing so in a pretty badass way both times. We also get to see Harcourt come out of her shell a little bit in these episodes showing that despite her rough exterior and annoyed with life attitude, she's actually a somewhat understanding and compassionate individual. Well, as compassionate as her job and life experience allows her to be. But like everyone else, despite what the initial impression would tell you, she's not a one-note character. There's some depth here, and we haven't even begun to explore it yet. We're just scratching the surface of Harcourt. In the latest three episodes, we get to see this team band together and bond with each other a lot more. They create a much better dynamic that was intentionally left out when they first formed. We really get to see them become a unit and grow as a group. Peacemaker and Diebeard are able to bury the hatchet over their mutual love of the same music, which even Harcourt jams out a little bit too later on. Harcourt sees the humanity in each of her teammates individually. And she even gets comfortable enough to reveal her real name to Peacemaker. Leota feels sympathy and empathy for Peacemaker, realizing he's not a bad dude, he's just a very... well... unfortunate one. Judo Master is a master of Judo, as one would expect from someone with such a name. And what he lacks in height, he makes up for an ass kick. Outside of the need to beat all those who oppose him, he really loves Cheetos. And you know what? Relatable. Even the characters outside of the main plots that are really only around for ambiance. Jamil the janitor, the nosy next door neighbor, Evan, Amber, they're all great. There is no small part in this show. I think each and every character that has been put to screen has gotten a chance, whether it be a big one or a small one, to shine. Outside of the core group, the show is always introducing new characters. And they never feel tacked on or out of place. It just feels like this part of the DC Extended Universe is constantly extending. The addition of Captain Locke to the plot was fun. He's a former, let's say, colleague of Clemson, and is every bit as heartless as Clemson was originally depicted to be. And this man gives zero fucks. Like, he can't even pretend to give one. That, that's how little he cares. Guy doesn't even attempt to hide his nefarious ways or bother coming up with believable lies for his actions. He literally murders three police officers and then tells the other cops that the Hamburglar did it. The guy is terribly transparent, completely blatant in his own bullshit. The cops on the show, while being as comically inept and hysterically worthless as most cops you'll find on TV shows, were hell-bent on doing their job. I mean, they might not have been good cops, but they were good cops. Once again, if any of that makes sense. But all that's about to change anyway, as the entire police squad, the prisoners that were kept in that jail, and probably elected officials surrounding them, have all been taken over by butterflies. The highlight of the show are obviously the jokes, which are really well-timed, well-acted, and just hilarious in their own right. 
It's honestly hard for me to separate what's scripted and what's improv because the way these actors play off each other is just so natural and the dialogue is consistently realistic. I don't want to go out of my way to emphasize just how funny the show is because A, it's obvious and B, I don't want to have a serious discussion on jokes. Kind of seems like an oxymoron. And me personally, I'm just a regular moron, so there's no need to add to that. The dynamics between the characters are often interesting. Leota's situation with her mother is almost a strange parallel to Peacemaker's relationship with his father, a parent whose love for their family comes secondary to their own selfish, questionable agendas. And just as Peacemaker wanted to live up to his dad's expectations to earn his unconditional love, Leota is trying to live up to her mother's expectations. Probably for the same exact reason. These two characters share the same exact unique problem. They have the same skill set of their parents. They could very well do what the people who spawn them do, but their hearts would get in the way. The show Peacemaker is completely unpredictable. I never know what's going on from one episode to the next. It always finds a way to surprise me, and every surprise thus far has been a pleasant one. This show is not afraid to take a risk, to introduce a new character, to make a joke on an existing character, to create a new dynamic, to make a parallel between two characters that you would think have nothing in common, to have characters who are portrayed as people who are not necessarily good or bad, they're just people. Very flawed people. That's the name of the game with The Peacemaker Show. And it's because of all these reasons, and many, many more, that this show is dope as fuck. And right before I go, if you guys want to see more Peacemaker videos, let me know in the comment section below by saying... I'm, so, I'm a fucking stud! So with all that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, Vinfuso. You all are the Degenerates, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. There are plenty of references to other characters in the DCEU. You know, we'll, we'll talk about Aquaman, but we don't need to cut in with a Jason Momoa cameo. That one didn't age quite so well. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. And Peacemaker's first season has finally come to an end. Which is pretty bittersweet. I mean, on one hand, it's nice to be at the ass end of things, so that this way we have a better view into the season as a whole. Wow, I really just used the word ass and whole in a sentence together, huh? Think there's any connection? No. Anyway, as I was trying to say, it's nice to be at the end of the season, so this way we can examine the first season in its entirety. But man, oh man, am I gonna miss the ride. A wise man once said, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey getting there. And I think that that's absolutely the case with this show. Not that the destination was bad per se, it's just the journey getting there was really something else. What I find really interesting is that at the core of this mostly comedy show is a bunch of very complicated relationships. Peacemaker loves his father, despite knowing that he's kind of a piece of shit. Oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. <clears throat> despite knowing that he's a piece of shit. Leota is trying to make her mother proud, despite knowing that she has done some pretty immoral shit in her day. And also currently. Despite the fact that Peacemaker has killed many butterflies following his release, he's still on friendly terms with the queen of those alien insects. I mean, at the end of the first season, Peacemaker is still taking care of Goth. Following an attempted hostile takeover of Earth, Peacemaker is still keeping this thing as a pet. Even Peacemaker's relationship with his own father isn't as black and white as the show would once have you think. I don't know that everybody watching caught on to this, but in a really fucked up way, Peacemaker's father actually did love him. Hear me out. He admits that he would've, and in his own mind, should've killed his own son, citing a list of various reasons as to why. From his sexuality, to his choice in music, to his lack of a hatred of those who are different than him? All valid enough reasons to murder your only living child. Once again, in his eyes. But he didn't. He had every opportunity to, and apparently also in his own eyes, every reason to, but he didn't. He still raised him. And furthermore, he took care of his eagle while he was away in prison for four years. He even stayed silent about being framed for the things that his son was doing. The one time he finally went after his kid was when he was under the impression that his son was trying to kill him. So the fucked up thing here is, Augie actually really did love his son. At least as much as someone like him could love someone who is so different from him. 
Not that I'm trying to humanize this character or romanticize this relationship. Clearly, he's not winning Parent of the Year by any means. I think you could say that his parenting methods were very, uh, off the book. But in his own weird way, he actually did care about his son. And Peacemaker, despite being very well aware and less than thrilled about what kind of a person his father was, did in fact love him. Which is why he has a mental breakdown when he finally has to kill him, just as he killed his brother when he was younger, under his father's supervision. There are absolutely no one-dimensional relationships on this show. Characters don't just feel one way about each other, they feel 100 different ways about each other. I like these kind of in-depth character relationships, because to me, that feels real. There's a whole lot of depth in the final two episodes of the first season, but not one was done without purpose. There's a lot I wasn't expecting in these last two episodes. Like when watching them, I wasn't expecting my girlfriend to burst out into tears when the cartoon eagle nearly bit the big one. And I also wasn't expecting the big bird to pull through. Since the very first time I saw this CGI creature, all I could think about is, how long? How long until James Gunn inevitably kills it? I mean, I'm glad it wasn't today, but I was pretty sure it was gonna be. Unfortunately, Mern did suffer that fate here, and seeing his little bug form crushed was crushing. Pun intended. I mean, look at that little hand reaching out. You know what? I don't, I don't even want to talk about it right now. I, I, I need a moment. Please stand by. The early lateness of Clemson sets Harcourt up as the new head on this proverbial Hydra. The torch is passed during this sweet little remake of E.T. And when Peacemaker kills his father, he's actually killing off a part of himself. He's killing off every shitty belief his father managed to brainwash into him. He's essentially killing off the character that we were introduced to in the Suicide Squad. And yet, that doesn't bring him the peace that he probably hoped it would. He's still constantly haunted by his father's taunts, still reminded of his father's disapproval. And even if Peacemaker knows that he's not real, it feels like he's still there. And much like the lasting effects of abuse and trauma, what's unseen to many has a strong presence that is felt within the individual going through this. Either that or his dad's a forest ghost. I don't know, one or the other. Another thing that I'm really fond of is the development of all of these characters. All throughout the season, each one of these characters has been growing and developing more and more. But none of them are at their final destination. Well, except for maybe Vigilante. Vigilante I don't really see progressing further than super heroic sociopathic nutjob. And quite frankly, I don't think I want to see him progress past that. He's perfect the way that he is. Perfectly imperfect. There's still a whole lot of room for growth in every one of the characters in the main cast. They're still learning and they're still progressing toward the people that they one day ultimately will be. But none of them are quite there yet. Peacemaker is still suffering constant moral dilemmas. Even in the last moments of the finale, Peacemaker spends that time questioning if he even did the right thing. He still wonders if he's now doomed humanity by killing the butterfly's cow. These episodes are the host of reveals. Adebayo tells the team how she got her job and who her mother is. Goff explains to John Cena that the butterflies aren't looking for world domination, but instead are out to save the planet from itself. And then of course you have the biggest reveal, which is that Beard Dye does in fact dye his beard. One thing that I really wanted to comment on, this might sound uh, minor, but it meant a lot to me. I really like the fact that the butterflies are none the wiser to who is a butterfly and who isn't. I like that they aren't somehow genetically programmed to recognize the difference between a human and an inhabited human. Because a lot of the time with similar premises and like different species, tropey writing would dictate that they could somehow sense each other. Usually through smell. It's almost always through smell. But yeah, that's not the case here, so I just wanted to comment on that and compliment it. Thank you for that. Something I touched on a few times in these videos was how Peacemaker and Adebayo's upbringings carry some parallels. Not perfect ones, but they're similar enough. Both had parents who are morally ambiguous at best, and who expect them to be a little bit more cold than they're comfortable with being. While these similar dynamics are never expressed in conversations between the two, the show does end with both Peacemaker and Adebayo confronting their mommy and daddy issues separately. 
As previously mentioned, Peacemaker takes his own father's life, and Leota outs her mother for her scheming ways on national TV. In terms of the ending of the season, I think that it's left very vague, and that might be intentional. Instead of ending this season with a period, followed by a to be continued, the finale leaves behind a giant question mark in its place. There's no real cliffhangers, there's no real setup. What happened happened, and who knows what's gonna happen next. I genuinely have no idea where they're going from here, but I'll tell you what, I am interested in finding out. This is a James Gunn project that we're talking about. Anything can happen. The Justice League in the final episode was so perfectly unnecessary. Like, I never expected these characters to show up in this show. They didn't need to show up in the show. You could have gone the whole season without them being there, and I would not have complained. But the fact that they did show up and that they were severely underutilized... Well, ironically enough, that's exactly how I'd like to see them utilized. The team showing up late for a job that was already well done, to the annoyance of our leads? Come on, that's some good shit right there. Who didn't want to see John Cena walk up to Jason Momoa and tell him to go fuck another fish? Now, I do have some complaints, but they're minor in comparison to the major positives the series has had to offer. But regardless, I do still think that they're pretty valid. The show's pacing was perfect right up until the last two episodes. And then at that point, it just felt like a rush to get through all the reveals and straight to the finale. Adebayo being Amanda Waller's daughter is revealed, but then it's mostly glossed over. I don't know, I just felt like it should have been a bigger deal than it eventually was. And you know, maybe some kind of arc would have followed it, but no, it just happens. And now everybody knows, and that's it really. Harcourt's sudden turn to the light side always felt a little bit forced to me. There are one or two smaller moments prior to these episodes where we get to see her begin to open up and accept her teammates, but it just feels like once they got their emotional foot in the door, that door just swung right open. She went from stoic to sucker, like, immediately. And we still know jack shit about Judo Master. You could have taken him out of this entire season, and, and who would have known? Who would have known? Maybe he's supposed to be part of the setup for season two. But like, you know, give us something, man. I'm not gonna complain too much about this one, if only because there will probably be some sort of payoff for his existence in season two. A personal complaint I have, which isn't saying anything about the show in terms of quality, but I enjoyed a lot of these characters in the show's first season. And now those characters are no longer in the show, on account of them being dead. I just would have liked to see a little bit more of these actors. But the unpredictability of who lives and who dies really does help drive the show. When it comes to these characters, get attached, but you know, don't get that attached. James Gunn is very quickly becoming George R.R. R. Martin with dick jokes. Well, with more dick jokes. But I think my biggest complaint is that Peacemaker's villainous shithead father, the White Dragon, who, by the way, now that I look at him, kind of resembles an edgy Power Ranger villain. He could have been better utilized. The showdown between these two was so short-lived. I mean, I understood that he was a backseat villain of the season, but he really shouldn't have been. I think this whole arc was deserving of more time. And the first season could have worked as a really great setup for a season two. You could have gone all Return of the Jedi with the second season. But no, he's taken out in their first ever encounter. And I know that their struggle will continue on in the next season, but as of now, it's going to be a mental fight of morals and parental problems. Could you imagine if the first season of Peacemaker ended with this shot? Like, this final scene, that was the setup for the second season? And listen, I, I, I hate to be the guy who runs creative ideas at a wall, but I think that would have been a much better ending. And it would have given the fan base something to talk about and get excited for, other than the revelation that Aquaman may fuck fish. All in all, I wouldn't say that the last two episodes of the season are bad by any means, but I do think that they're the weakest of the series thus far. They're still good. Even really good. But the show's been better. And I hope that it continues to be better. Again, I'm not saying I don't like these episodes, I'm just saying that I like them a little bit less than all the others. It's a slight dip in quality for sure, but that happens and it's normal. It should by no means be taken as an indication that the future of the show will be lacking in any way, shape, or form. I certainly don't see that being the case. These weren't bad episodes, they were just not as good as the others.
Peacemaker's first season is one of the most impressive and addictive first seasons of a show I have ever seen. And I think what makes Peacemaker work so well as a series is that it's goofy, and it's very aware of its goofiness. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but the characters in this goofy-ass universe do. The show works as a character study of the characters in the show, just with more fake fart. With all that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.